happy to see today is our host pastor, Brother James Jones from Indianapolis back there, and many other friends that's sitting around. It certainly is a privilege today to speak to such a host of people who I am expecting to live an eternity with in glory. Death is a million times preferable to ten more days of this life. If you knew what was ahead of you, if you knew what was ahead of you, you'd be glad to be stepping over tonight. Death, death, death is common to people, but that's big dignified. Quickly, 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 quickly. The sisters, but no, I am. We didn't commit suicide, we committed an act of revolutionary suicide protesting the conditions of an inhumane world. Happy to see today is our host pastor, Brother James Jones from Indianapolis back there, who I am expecting to live an eternity with in glory. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Long for Truth. My name is Daniel Long. William Branham, faith healer and founder of the Message Cult, was responsible for launching the career of the infamous cult leader Jim Jones. On November 18, 1978, former Message Minister Jim Jones and 909 members of his People's Temple cult died after willingly ingesting cyanide-laced Kool-Aid, Jones was ordained as an independent Assemblies of God minister by Joseph Matson Bose, who, along with William Branham, launched Jones's faith healing career. Joining me once again to talk about all of this is John Collins. Uh, John is um, the curator of William Branham Historical Research and the author of several books. His books include William Branham, 20th Century Charlatan, Preacher Behind the White Hoods, and my personal favorite, Jim Jones and the Malachi for Elijah Prophecy. Let's see if I can get that up there and get it right. There we go. There we go. And uh, so, John, thanks so much for coming on. Welcome back. Thanks. It's good to be back. All right. So in the last episode you and I did together, we talked about Jim Jones, but we also discussed other key figures in the message like um, uh, Gordon Lindsay and F.F. Bosworth and John Alexander Dowie. But I want to spend most of this video talking all about the infamous cult leader, Jim Jones, and how he was really connected to William Branham. And you have uh, done some additional research ever since writing uh, this book right here. And um, right. so we're going to talk about that as well. But before we do all that, why don't you tell us a little bit about your website and the research you're doing and any other projects that uh, you might be working on? Right. My website is william-branham.org. It's William Branham Historical Research. And on that site, we're re researching not just William Branham, but the entire post-World War II healing revival and basically how it influenced American Christianity. Mm. It wasn't just Jones. It wasn't just Branham. There were hundreds of men involved in this movement. And many of them washed their hands of it later mm. and tried to erase the history that existed. Um, my, my family was deeply involved in William Branham's cult following. My grandfather was the pastor of his tabernacle in Jeffersonville for almost 50 years. So I was born and raised in this thing. And most of the history that I have on my website, all of my peers and myself had no idea even existed. But many of the wow. leaders did know. So I've been working diligently to try to publish all of the the history that has been erased from the public. I told this story in the last uh, video that we did together, but uh, I was watching. I was literally watching one of your videos on your YouTube channel when it went down. I was eating my dinner and I was watching the one of the videos and all of a sudden it just went blank. And it said I went and clicked on it, tried to go back to your channel and it said that the channel had been deleted due to copyright strike. Um, yeah. So, yeah. So give just a little bit of uh, 
of a background there or info there. Yeah, it's it's crazy. I have a YouTube inf info page on my website, <clears throat> and anything that was linking to YouTube now takes you to the page and describes the story on my website. But mm. basically, I was uh, I was also I was offside away from my network, and my network got attacked. Um, I I have quite a sophisticated network because I run a software company and mm -hmm. I was watching the flood of attacks through the logs at the same time they were attacking my network. They were doing a mass copyright strike <clears throat> and with YouTube, after you get so many copyright strikes, whether they're valid or not, they deactivate the account. Mm -hmm. And then you have the opportunity to legally fight it, which is very expensive mm -hmm. or you let it go, which is what my legal counsel advised. Okay. It's not just YouTube they've attacked, though. Um, and this, this one is interesting. Okay. They are attacking some of my other networks as well with whatever provisions those social networks have for attack. For instance, Facebook has the ability to flag something as offensive. Yep. And I, for a period of time, I was getting a mass strike of offensive posts from everything ranging to quotes of William Branham, just simply, you know, my statements describing the, the history and the cult. Mm. Well, what has happened is they have actually flagged William Branham, the person, as an offensive person. Really? So, <laughs> yes. So whenever, whenever I post, there are, if I mention the name William Branham in the post, I actually can't even click the advertise button. <clears throat> they flagged, um, Jim Jones is now flagged as a dangerous person. And the algorithms aren't mature enough in Facebook to detect, is this a live dangerous person or is this a historical dangerous person? So in my case, both William Branham and Jones are historical, but anything I post gets flagged now and, and the wow. entire site is at risk. Did you, oh, just, just off the, you know, off topic a little bit, you do know that uh, they're getting ready to make a movie about Jim Jones. Or I saw that. Yeah, and I think it, who is it, Leon yeah. DiCap, whatever his name is. I don't, I don't Leonardo know. Leonardo DiCap. Yeah, Leonardo yeah. DiCap. Yeah, okay. Yeah, he's uh, supposed to play, I guess, uh, Jim Jones. But uh, right. but anyway, all right. So um, these, are, these are the things that you have to deal with on a regular basis. How are you holding up? It's, I've learned to adjust. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> the video, for instance, they, it's not just YouTube they attacked. I went on national uh, public radio in Canada, I mm -hmm. think it was last year, and I mentioned the site, the videos, I mentioned the YouTube attack, and the cult actually attacked my second video host, which wow. was in another country, and it came down a week after that interview. I've, um, I, I run a software company, so I, I allocated some efforts towards creating a new video portal on my website. And now it's coming from many different feeds. If one video site goes offline, another one just pops up. And the reason why is because they hold William Branham to be such a high, you know, just just this this almost godlike figure. Mm -hmm. They do. So, John, what I'm going to do is I'm going to put uh, all the links to your books. I'm going to put the link to your website. And, folks... John has a YouTube channel called Leaving the Message. It would be uh, just awesome if you guys would go over there and subscribe to that channel. I'm going to put a link to his channel uh, in the YouTube description, but I'm also going to pin a comment with a link right there to the top. Uh, John uh, has been um, putting some videos up, and uh, it's actually taken the place of his uh, previous channel on YouTube. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's relatively new. We haven't done much with it. We're still in the early stages of growing this after the last one got destroyed. Okay. All right. So make sure you head over there and subscribe to that. So let's um let's talk a little bit about uh, the early years of Jim Jones, if that's okay. Um, what was it that caused Jim Jones to even become a pastor in the first place? You know, it's... It's a complicated event that I'm going to give multiple threads of background into. Okay. And the most interesting of which, the timing of this recording, um, yesterday alone, a prophecy of William Branham was deemed failure that was tied to this Jim Jones event. Yeah, I saw you posted that on, uh, yeah. on Facebook. 
Yeah, it's it, it's unbelievable. William Branham. See, I I grew up. The pastors in the the message cult were always um, listing these prophecies. William Branham allegedly had seven. I quote unquote seven wow. prophecies of 1933, and there are actually many more because the lining the lineup of seven prophecies changes from stage persona to stage mm. persona. But one of those, the one that one of the seven that I was raised with was to believe that right before the end of days, a woman would become president. And because she was female and William Brandon was misogynistic, the female would lead America to its destruction. Hmm. <laughs> and <clears throat> so whenever Kamala Harris was elected as vice president, the, all the message people were just raving because she, as soon as Joe Biden passes or after his, after he is out of office, she has now an opportunity to be elected president. Uh, yep. There was another part, another component of this um, this alleged prophecy that the, the went by allowing the women to vote. Also, again, misogynistic. Hmm. The women would cause the destruction of the United States wow. in the voting. <clears throat> so that's that's how I was raised. My wife was in this cult, and she was not allowed to vote until we escaped. That's yeah, it's, interesting. It's, it was quite a big deal. I remember the first time she voted. This was a big deal for her. Yeah, so in 1955, William Branham began claiming that by electing a woman that it would lead to the destruction of the United States. Mm -hmm. But what happened in 19 uh, – this prophecy was introduced into his stage persona in 1955, which ties to the Joan event. That's why I'm bringing this up. Okay. And we'll, we'll go deeper into that later. Okay. But what, what happened was the – the civil, the anti civil rights movement um, that John that Branham was a part of was heavily focused against President Kennedy mm. because Kennedy was a civil rights advocate and he was he was rising as a leader to basically open the doors towards integration of public schools etc. Right. Well. <clears throat> As soon as Kennedy enters the scene, William Branham changes this prophecy to be now it's not a woman. It's either or a, a man or a woman, or he adds in parentheses, perhaps the Catholic Church. And um, it was so. So, you know. so he switched the prophecy all together once Kennedy was elected. Not just not just when Kennedy was elected, but he changes it multiple times. Oh, when. When Kennedy was running for office, that's whenever he heavily got into this women are voting because it was a common idea back then that the women voting would sway Kennedy's election because he was a handsome man. So they believed mm. that it was the women's vote going to going to make this happen, which okay. was actually not true. It wasn't the women's vote that got him in. But as soon as he was – this is the interesting part. As soon as Kennedy – be, it was announced that he was going to be elected and he had won the vote. William Branham said actually that that prophecy had been fulfilled, <sighs> which which created a huge problem after Kennedy was assassinated. Man. So, yeah. So now how is that now? How is that connected to you said that was kind of connected to the whole Jones thing? How is that connected to Jones in that in that sense? Yeah. So this is you won't you actually won't find this on my website. This is research that we're currently going through and digesting, and we're deep into the digesting of this information. Okay, so so then you guys are hearing this first, <laughs> right here. It's, yeah, th this actually this is actually the first interview that I've had while in the midst of this research. Okay, so so what happened because Jones was what he became and because this latter rain movement created such a distaste in american christianity yep, yep many of the leaders in this that were involved in this movement erased this history mm -hmm. the cult that i grew up in was no different <clears throat> and there were actually recordings of william branham during there were multiple branham jones campaigns i'm learning um, I don't think I mentioned that on the last show either. No. But, um, there were sermons recorded with Jim Jones that were, quote unquote, misfiled into different wow. years, different months. 
and there were entire records that just disappeared. We, we found two archives remaining, only two, that contained some of these missing records. And we were able to get into one of them. We're still waiting to get into the second. But when, once we got in there, we didn't know what we were going to find because we believed that it was Will Jones who needed Branham and that William Branham launched Jones' career and this was the big deal. Well, you're going to hear, I'm, I'm going to watch the shock on your face because this was <laughs> actually not the full truth. That it was much deeper than this. One of the records. Uh oh, um, here we go. <laughs> you're looking at a herald of faith. This is Joseph Matson Bose. Here, let me let me put you full screen here so we can see that. There we go. You're looking at a a old herald of faith magazine. This is. Um, 1954. This is just one of several things that we've identified, and you're going to see a big oh, photograph of William Brown yeah, right there yeah. on the cover. Yep. Mm -hmm. Well, even when we started seeing some of these, we didn't understand the full depth of what we had just found. Um, as as we're reading through this, and and I found I actually just found this I think last week. There is a letter in this magazine that mentions Joseph Matson Bose, who is fighting basically publicly through his publication with the voice of healing, Gordon Lindsay and the voice of healing. Hmm. And I didn't, I didn't understand it. I had to go start piecing together a timeline of what, what we're finding, right? So really quickly, so that people know, so maybe some people are watching this and they're not sure exactly what, what's the difference between the voice of healing and, um, uh, Bose's, uh, magazine. Actually, let's take it a, a step back okay. from all of that. And all let's right. talk about Bose. All right. <clears throat> so within Pentecostalism in 47, 48, there was this movement that emerged called latter rain mm -hmm. and latter rain is was literally sparked by william branham's um tours through canada there was a group in saskatchewan north battleford saskatchewan who thought that william branham's healing power was the manifestation of the latter rain to 1907 azusa street's former rain Okay. So they started looking towards Joel 2, the prophecy in Joel 2 of the former mm -hmm. and latter rain. And they said, this is it. And <clears throat> they became militant Christians. They were creating what's called Joel's army. Yep. Army of Christians to come forward. This led to the new apostolic reformation, all of these things that we see today. Mm. <clears throat> William Branham was a key catalyst for this, as was a man by the name of Franklin Hall. Atomic oh, power yeah. with God through fasting yep. and prayer, Frank, Franklin Hall. So these two men created this movement called Latter Rain. Well, <clears throat> this was big in Canada. It propagated into the United States through key figures, but the two main ones as it relates to Branham and Jones were A.W. Rasmussen and... Uh, Joseph Matson Bose, okay, who led the Independent Assemblies of God. <clears throat> a Rasmussen was the founder, basically, of the Independent Assemblies, and they joined they joined with the main assembly sect. But due to Latter Rain and the assemblies denouncing Latter Rain, they separated once more, and he and Matson Bose were basically spreading this through the United States, along with other key figures in the Latter Rain movement. Gotcha. Now, and and Gordon Lindsay uh, at one at one time supported the latter rain uh, message. Not just that, the two merged. So there were <clears throat> there were two movements. There were there were the Voice of Healing revivals that mm -hmm. William Branham was a part of, and then this latter rain thing grew into a movement. It was initially just a sect, but the sect became a movement. And then all of these ministers joined into it, and it became the Voice of Healing slash Latter Rain Revivals. And for a period of time, they merged, and then they diverged. Okay. And 
it's it's the divergence that becomes interesting when it relates to Jones. Then and then that is what you were holding up there. You were holding up the um, uh, the the Bose uh, magazine, right? <clears throat> Right. So this is Joseph Matson Bose's publication. See, the Voice of Healing revivals were named after the Voice of Healing magazine. Okay. Yep. Um, you can see these epi- you can see these issues on my website. <clears throat> the Voice of Healing ma- publication was initially created as a um, as a advertisement for William Branham. But when it became a movement, the Voice of Healing magazine became the Voice of Healing Evangelists and the Voice of Healing Revivals. Well, Herald of Faith was the uh, publication by Bose, which was deeply rooted in Latter Rain, but also it was like Voice of Healing. It was just a religious publication that was advertising this flavor of Pentecostalism. Gotcha. Gotcha. Now, um, Voice of Healing and Herald of Faith were at odds with one another because of the latter rain uh, message that um, uh, I'm, I'm assuming the vo- that uh, those of the Voice of Healing didn't agree with. Yeah, so they, they weren't at odds. History records them as being joined as one. Okay. In other words, whenever I was growing up, I heard the name Joseph Matson Bose. I heard William Branham. I heard Voice of Healing. I thought this was one big united thing. Okay. And it it wasn't until last week when we're going through these archives, I stumble across this article by Joseph Matson Bose, where he mentions fighting with Voice of Healing. Mm. And so that set off my curiosity. Why are they fighting? I want to know. And. I, I actually got this wrong in several of my publications because of the history and the way that it's been recorded. Jim Jones, uh, you know, he grew up in the Indianapolis area. Yep. He, if you've read the book, The Raven, he was deeply involved with Nazarene Christianity, Pentecostal Christianity. <clears throat> They're in Lynn, Indiana, that he, where he was raised. And the neighboring so- town, I think, is Richmond. Uh, where the the Laurel Street Tabernacle was and all of these revivals, I thought they were just regular Pentecostal revivals. That's w- that's the way history has been recorded. And the the book mentions William Branham campaigning and or the latter rain campaigning campaigning near him. And when I looked through the lineup of the sermons of William Branham, I found that in 1953 in May. He and Ern Baxter held a series of campaigns in Connorsville, Indiana. So <clears throat> for the book that you were reading, I went, I found the newspaper article, I found it advertising, uh, Ern Baxter, William Branham. Here's what I missed. Ern Baxter ditched him. Wait a minute. Ern was- Baxter ditched Ern Baxter Branham. ditched Branham? Yeah, I had no idea. I mean, this this history is unknown. People people are not aware this history exists. Man. <clears throat> so they're, so they're what was the reason? A, Go ahead. I'm sorry. They advertised a 10-day meeting together, 10-day uh, revival together. And it's in the newspapers, Ern Baxter and William Branham. Well, if you go on to the um, – if you find the transcript for their meeting, Branham mentions that there was a differences of opinions – and that he and his son Billy Paul were holding it alone for the first time, and he seen, he appears to be glad because he had a difference in doctrine. Oh my, oh my, wow! All right, so we know the history of uh, of both um, uh, Bose and Lindsay's magazines. What? Let, let's go back a little bit and let's talk about how Jim Jones actually met William Branham and the history behind that, if we could. So some of that information also is relatively new um, with this treasure trove of information that we've just identified. That's amazing. Yeah. So if you read The Raven, you realize that Jones learns about the Latter Rain movement in a unnamed revival near his house. Well, it doesn't really describe the events that lead up to his conversion. But Branham holds this meeting in 1953 in Connorsville. Okay. And if you picture the landscape of Indiana and 
general Pentecostalism of the 50s. If you were a Pentecostal and there was a Pentecostal revival near your town and you were interested or persuaded in the Pentecostal affiliation, you went to see it because there weren't a lot of these things. Right. right. So Branham holds this thing. It's it's likely. We can't say Jones was definitely there because there's no roster, but it's likely Jones was there. That supposition is somewhat confirmed in the fact that Jones immediately after, like weeks after, he starts attending the Laurel Street Tabernacle. And in the in the books that you've read and in the publications that I've written on the Jonestown Institute, that also is insignificant until last week. Really? <clears throat> Yes. Even in the book, The Raven, it just talks about it as a Pentecostal church and Assemblies of God church, which was actually true. It was Assemblies of God. But we just discovered, <clears throat> whenever I wrote the, the article that is on the Jonestown Institute about the full gospel origins of People's Temple, I mentioned the, the groundbreaking of the Laurel Street Tabernacle in 1949, which, you know, I, I looked at the date initially when I was writing, and I was thought, you know, that's curious because the latter rain revival swept through the United States in 1949. Mm -hmm. But this was a main Assemblies of God's church. I didn't really expect it to be affiliated in any way. Uh, there was a, <clears throat> the Indiana district head of the Assemblies of God, his name was Roy H. Weed. And he came down to dedicate the tabernacle, as did uh, Lester Sumrall. Both oh, of those men. Oh, okay. Yeah, well, Sumrall was involved in this in some sense. I had no idea that Sumrall was even um, involved in some of this stuff. I should have looked when I wrote that article, but Sumrall's name is mentioned in William Branham's sermons. But not just that. Last, I think this might have been last week or two weeks ago. We found in one of these magazines, Roy Weed is the one who defended William Branham on the floor of the Assemblies of God. So when the Assemblies of God uh, rejected the latter rain movement, when they made that big statement and they put that out there, um, Weed was the one that was on the floor? Weed was on the floor, and in fact, he... He basically revolted. You can find his son giving testimony that Indiana became a rogue district of the assemblies. And you just found this out two weeks ago. Yes, either two or, week, two or three weeks ago. That I have some other people helping me go through the information, and hmm. we went through it, and we totally missed it. But <clears throat> once once I started piecing together the timeline and saw, you know, the, the information that's in these documents, I'm starting to realize that this thing was much, much different than history has recorded. Okay. So 1953, Will, William Branham gets snubbed by Ern Baxter. <clears throat> 1950, so this magazine with the describing the fight is 1954. And the reason for the fight, <clears throat> William Branham was supposed to be one of the main speakers in Chicago for the Voice of Healing Revival Annual Convention. Okay. And he was advertised all through Chicago. Joseph Matson Bose, who's big in this thing, he's in the latter rain. William Branham is his hero. He's telling everybody, come here, William Branham. And Voice of Healing Revivalist booted Branham out. <laughs> he oh. was not a primary speaker. All right. Well, let's talk then about... Um just how Jones actually met. Now, I going through your videos and watching your videos, reading your book. Um, Jones was first in, was first introduced to the Voice of Healing revival at what the Cato Tabernacle? Is that correct? In 1950, I want to say 55, 56. That is what we formally believed, and mostly because of the book, The Raven. Okay. We we did not know that the Laurel Street Tabernacle was affiliated with the Latter Rain movement or William Branham. So 
Okay, so really quickly, John, I'm sorry, I don't, I don't mean to interrupt you, but Laurel Street Tabernacle, just explain what that is so that folks will kind of get an idea. When you say Laurel Street Tabernacle, what are you referring to? So that is, an, that is a very important piece of Jones history. Okay. <clears throat> Jim Jones was raised somewhat Pentecostal in a Nazarene church, and he started street preaching at a very early age. He started getting involved with youth ministries in the Pentecostal religion, and <clears throat> he became a Methodist preacher. Okay. But during the time he was a Methodist, he was, he was asked to come speak at the Laurel Street Tabernacle where these latter rain healing revivals were being held. Oh. The speaking is not the important part. The fact that he continued to speak to the extent that he became a popular speaker, and for weeks at a time, he would hold all meetings. He would preach all meetings in the Laurel Street Church. Wow. So he was as early as 19, that was 1953, I believe it was, he started speaking at the Laurel Street Tabernacle. And they started advertising hundreds of healings. Come to the Laurel Street Tabernacle and watch Jim Jones heal you. So he uh, he was uh, a primary healer. I mean, he was doing the same kinds of things that William Branham was doing and that the other faith healers like Oral Roberts was doing. He was laying his hands on people. He had healing lines, all of that stuff. Right, right. He was... From what we're gathering, and we're still digesting this information, there's, there, it's overwhelming the amount, and trying to connect it is very difficult. <clears throat> but we're starting to understand that he was being trained in the latter rain movement theology long before he and Branham held their joint campaign together. Wow. So, okay. Now the book, uh, I know the book, The Raven, in, in case folks don't know about that, that's a uh, book that is uh, about the life of in, in times of Jim Jones, correct? So right. people know what that is. Um, they, they kind of say that he kind of, Jones actually became an, almost an atheist. Um, is that true? Something. That was the re that was the recorded history, but I'm going to disagree with that later in this in this video. I won't go into that right now. All right, all right. So what's the next step? All right. So he's now uh, preaching there at Laurel Street Tabernacle. He's um, he, he's really a, a growing in popularity as a faith healer. And so when exactly does he and Branham actually? Uh, meet and then kind of uh, join forces. So let's jump forward. Let's go forward in time a bit so that we can go back in time. Okay. So in 1956, the two men held their first healing revival together. Their first public, this was a big convention. I think somewhere in the neighborhood of 10,000 people came to the Cato Tabernacle wow. to hear William Branham preach for People's Temple. Oh. <clears throat> this was called, according to Jones, the Brotherhood Healing uh, Brotherhood Healing Campaign okay. Crusade. Brotherhood Healing Cr Crusade, which is interesting because Jones later became Disciples of Christ, which were called the Brotherhood. So the first <clears throat> the first meeting, the first convention that Jim Jones held with William Branham at the Cato Tabernacle, June of nineteen fifty six was called, Jones named it the Brotherhood Healing Crusade. And this, this gets really interesting. I have, to, I have to make this point to go backwards in time so that I can go forwards in time. Okay. <laughs> There's so many interconnected pieces, it's crazy. But the fact that Jones gave it this name was actually, it actually threw us down a path that we couldn't connect because this seemed like a single event. And what's interesting is the, Bran the current Branham regime started fighting us over this, this connection because they said it's guilt by association. Yeah. This was a one-time event. There were no more Jones-Branham events. These, keep in mind, these were men who were there, who were making this argument, right? The actual name of this event was called the Second Annual, not First, Second Annual Christian Fellowship Convention. And <clears throat> this, 
when I found this, now I started piecing things together. I was able to find the third and the fourth annual conventions of which William Branham is still a part of. So him and Jones, uh, so so Branham and Jones were both part of one, two, and three. I'll save that thought. <laughs> we're, we're, we're gonna. <clears throat> the story is actually more interesting than even that. Okay. Um, I need to make. Th- like I said, this is a, a deeply, deeply connected puzzle that we only have part of the pieces because history has been erased. So for us to connect the previous history to the overall history, I have to show you this piece of the puzzle because we're missing. 10 other pieces of the puzzle, right? Okay. Because history's been erased. Voice of Healing, or Herald of Faith magazine, Joseph Matson bose his um, co-editor was named Reverend Glenn Parton. Okay. Joseph Matson bose had a publication before this that was called, I think it was the Latter Rain Messenger or some Latter Rain publication. Glenn Parton... He had a publication that was called the Christian Fellowship Magazine. These two magazines converged and created Herald of Faith, but the convention itself was named after the Christian Fellowship that Parton had. So his business entity was basically the grounds for the second annual convention of Jim Jones. What we don't have, the piece of the puzzle, the reason I had to go forward in time because I can't go back in time, the other archive that we've not yet investigated holds the pieces of the puzzle to what was the first annual. Was Branham involved? I don't know. What was the first annual convention? But if you piece it together with the timeline that we have, so let's let's go back in time again. Okay. I've got I've got this article which mentions Matson Bose fighting with Voice of Healing. Last year in December in 1953, you advertised that William Branham would be speaking. I advertised that William Branham would be speaking. And then you all fought and would not permit him to speak. I object, Joseph Matson Bose. Okay. 1954, the the objection happens, and they start fighting each other publicly through their magazines. At the same time, Ern Baxter, who's Branham's longtime campaign manager, partner, they were called the Baxter-Branham campaigns in their advertisements in the newspapers. Baxter leaves them high and dry. I'm not speaking with you. You go speak this thing in Connersville. I'm not doing it. So they start fighting. After the fight doesn't win, Branham's not even mentioned in the, ma- in the lineup of the evangelists. After they start fighting, they create a new convention. And now Herald of Faith starts publishing William Branham articles, some of which are written by William Branham. Wow. They're publishing publishing sermons written by Jones. They're publishing – they're actually publishing Jones' sermons as well. I've got in my blog, I've got a sermon of Jones that – I, I don't even think is yet published on the Jonestown Institute because it was in this magazine that wow. doesn't that has been mysteriously disappeared. So Jones was really, really heavily involved in this whole thing. From what we're starting to surmise, and this is not just opinion, this is based on the elements of fact that we do have now. It's starting to paint a much bigger picture. You've got Branham who's been ousted. He's no longer a big part of this movement. He's, he's been snubbed. He's to the extent that they're publicly fighting in their magazines. Branham's out. You've got Bose, who's a big leader and promoter of Branham's theology, the latter rain theology, and he's fighting to get Branham back in. You've got Roy Weed, who was the who was big into the assemblies in Indiana. He, he and Jones were have been connected through the Laurel street tabernacle. He frequented the Laurel street tabernacle. He's fighting for Branham. So you got all these, this group of men who are fighting for Branham. Well, you've got the main trunk of the voice of healing. All of those evangelists are saying, no, we don't want him in here. According to Ern Baxter, 
Branham left his calling when he started teaching. So 1955, that's where it gets interesting. 1955 is when Branham introduced this women is women electing president prophecy. This is a brand new prophecy introduced during this time. Jones gets ordained into the tabernacle. Jones founds the uh, wings of what is, wings of deliverance organization. Jones leaves his his post and becomes ordained into the uh, independent assemblies of God just a few months after this. You've got this, this thing is growing off in the corner that is creating a entity, a business entity to host the Branham campaigns. Mm. So now you have, they're, they're, they're working together, Jones and Branham uh, at this point now in time where you're, that you're talking about, they are both working together. And I, um, I, I actually uh, have some audio uh, from, I, I downloaded a couple of sermons where uh, uh, Branham actually mentions uh, James Jones is what, what, right, what he calls right. him, James Jones. Happy to see today is our host pastor, Brother James Jones from Indianapolis back there. Um, so how, so how close how close were they? Did I mean, were they, you know, can you can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah. So, again, we don't have all the pieces of the puzzle. I can tell you what it looks like from the pieces we do have, the biggest of which is the one that you just mentioned, J Brother James Jones. Hmm. What, <clears throat> this was one of the sermons, if I recall, that was misfiled into a different location. I believe this was in... Um, I believe this was one of the ones that was filed in Indianapolis, if memory serves. We called, boy, we called the current regime out on it because they had misfiled several sermons, and they, they never responded to us, but shortly after it was published, some sermons have been misfiled, and we've moved them. Hmm. So, again, the current regime is fighting to say that there was one single, only one, Jones Branham event. But the one in which you reference, it became problematic because it wasn't in Indiana. This was Jim Jones in Illinois hosting a Branham convention. So, so the let me let me, I, I got to back that up because I, I got to right. make sure I'm hearing this right. So the recording that I have where where Branham is praising James Jones is not at the Cato Tabernacle. It's no. in Illinois. It's in Chicago? No. It, it's in Chicago, and I think the book that you have has the outdated information. My, uh, So the book that you have, it's kind of funny because I was stumbling onto information that was groundbreaking. No, This history had not existed. My new book, the one that's out now, is called The Preacher Behind the White Hoods, hmm. A Critical Examination of William Branham and His Message. The book that you're reading was an appetizer for the book that was coming. It wasn't. Ah. It wasn't even the full published information. So you're going to find more history in this one. Okay. But let me say it like this: Now that we have the pieces of the puzzle, you've got Branham, who's been ousted. Gordon Lindsay was Branham's primary campaign manager. Gordon Lindsay snubbing Branham. All of the men who were Branham's campaign managers, the ones who hosted his meetings, let me say that again, the ones who were hosting his <laughs> meetings have kicked him out. And that would and include, now, go ahead. Now Joseph Matson Bose and Jim Jones join forces and Jones is hosting his meetings. That is just, like that's really incredible information. Um, so. When you in your article that you just put up uh, a couple of days ago on um, Lindsay snubbing um, Branham, in that article, I'm going to read what you said here because I want you to I want you to talk about that just for a minute. And I got it. Ah, where did I put it? Okay. Um, you say in your article, 
It was formally believed that Jim Jones needed William Branham to kickstart his career at the Cato Tabernacle in 1906. As it turns out, William Branham needed Jim Jones. And that is why, because he was pretty much abandoned by his campaign managers. And so Jones jumps right in there and starts hosting William Branham meetings. That's craziness, man. That is craziness. It's it's crazy. Um, We don't know why yet they snubbed him. And, and in fact, the article that you referenced, that was published, um, what was that? That was, that was on yeah, the was 16th, last, yeah. On the 16th, just last week. Yeah. <clears throat> Some of this we're still digesting and we're learning new pieces every day, but we knew that he was snubbed in a third campaign. Um, oh, wow. So we went back and we went to the middle of time we went to the second annual convention so that we could describe the first annual which we know nothing about which branham was likely there but we don't know at at minimum bose was there possibly jones we don't know <clears throat> there was a third annual convention and in the third annual convention william branham was the primary speaker with his new campaign team Jim Jones was a primary component of it. It was wow. in Indianapolis. Jones was again a host in this meeting. So Jones is literally hosting the Branham campaigns. That is that's some really I mean, that's groundbreaking stuff, in my opinion, uh, in in Pentecostal history, because you have this uh, you have this cult leader that, uh, you know, kind of launches the career of another cult leader and then this other cult leader kind of te- or a soon to be cult leader I should say kind of takes over and helps him it's yeah. like what I, <laughs> uh, what's I, I'm working with cult experts and we're going through this history because this is this is unknown this has been history that's been rewritten by several groups all of which have key stake in this they if this history were to become known it's a black eye for many many groups and we discussed the fact that it was as though you created a cookie cutter mold of how to create a cult, handed it over to the whoever was working with Branham campaigns, and then just started stamping cult leaders because we see wow. all of these splinter groups that emerge as a result of this movement. Okay. Now, you have this entity now that exists where you have Jones and Branham together, they're working together, they're preaching together, they're kind of partners. Um, Mm -hmm. You also have some other big names in the Pentecostal movement that knew Jones as well. And I'm going to guess was involved in this campaign. And one of those leaders would have been F.F. Uh, F. Bosworth. Am I correct on that? <laughs> Not just Bosworth. You've heard the name T.L. Osborne. Yes. Big, big into the ministries. T.L. Osborne was a featured name in this thing. Wow. Mis- Mr. Pentecost himself, David Duplicis. Wow. I, if memory serves, I think I found that in the Voice of Healing magazine. He was there setting up, um, you know, different organizations within this thing. This was a growing movement. Man, so, um, so all of these key leaders, these key figures, were um, right there in the mix of this whole Branham uh, Jones entity movement revival that you you know uh, if you want to call it that they were all together working with this future cult leader who was about to become probably one of the most famous cult leaders in all of the world and they're you know you you can't say this is guilt by association that's for sure (laughs) I'll, i'll guarantee you if you were to write in today to the billy graham crusades and ask them if he ever worked with jim jones i will bet that they deny it but i will also show you a newspaper article where he's there really <laughs> you're talking billy graham act billy graham <laughs> this man that man i had no idea jones was that popular what was it then that caused him uh to split away from um william branham and to just totally abandon him 
So this <clears throat> this is new information that I've not talked about at all in public. I'm still waiting to get all of the pieces. I can find reference to the facts that I don't have. But <clears throat> in the third annual campaign, the third annual campaign of the Christian Fellowship, Inc., International Christian Fellowship Convention, it was called, <clears throat> William Branham said or did something. We don't know what, but whatever it was was so horrific that an open letter was circulated demanding that he be snubbed by all, not just Voice of Healing, demanding mm. that he be silenced. And several of the quote-unquote prophets, the big ones, started prophesying that he had said something so bad that he was going to die. Jones included. And um, in the last video I took that, that you and I did, the last podcast slash video uh, uh, about Jim Jones that we did, I took a, a piece of that uh, audio and, and played it uh, there right. in the beginning of that. And that is some really, um, man, that's just some really crazy stuff. Some are listening. They won't tell you the truth because the black book is the easiest gravy train that they've ever been on. Yet Alan came to me, Al Roberts spoke this, Billy Graham came right to us, Iams, Jack and me in Claypool Hotel, said, I don't believe a thing in that Bible hardly. But he said, it's the way to make a living. Billy Graham, who I prophesied his death, Billy Branham rather, said his head would be, I said, he'll lose his head. His head was cut off in Texas. He said, you can't preach the truth about that Bible. He said, you can't preach reincarnation. You cannot preach the truth about the Bible. You will be in trouble. I said, I choose to preach the, preach the truth. He said, well, I'll be around while you will be in trouble. Well, I'm still here, and his head is cut off from his body. So, right. So, so since that video that we did... <clears throat> I, th I think we talked about finding that at that time. Well, we, the piece of the puzzle we didn't have, we still don't have the original letter that circulated. We're hoping that it's in the other archive that we found, but we don't know until we go, go there. What we do know is what the Herald of Faith and the Voice of Healing magazines have said about this letter. This was a big deal because both campaigns were talking about it. And apparently... A. A. Allen was one of the strongest oppositions to whatever William Branham did or said. I can find some references to a statement that Jones made about the divisions, and he's talking about somebody, he doesn't mention the name, who tried to convince him that it was significantly important to think about whether or not hell was eternal. And to the general Christian public, this has no meaning. To me, who grew up in the Branham movement, that point is significant. Why is that? Because William Branham taught that hell was not eternal, that it, every scripture talking about it being everlasting or eternal was incorrect, <clears throat> and that People were people. He says people could, might be punished for five minutes. They might be punished, what? but hell, hell was not hell was not an eternal thing. And it wasn't that this was this side topic that you could take as an opinion or you know give or take. Branham was adamant: you must believe this to be Christian that hell is not eternal. A after leaving, I'm like, well, what does that even matter? But when I was in it, this was a core fundamental belief. Okay. You have just uh, shared a, a just a massive amount of information and some stuff that not I don't think you and your group right now, really, John, are the only people who you know, other than right now, the only people who actually know the depth of um, connection that was between Branham and Jones. Yeah, we're that's part of the difficulty. We have nothing to reference and. It's even more difficult when we publish something, you'll notice even on the simple blog post or if I write for the Jonestown Institute, I have a list of references that are longer than sometimes than the text that I've written. I've seen that, it's, yeah. 
It is because we're fighting against men who are erasing or changing, altering history. And because they're changing it, what we're saying is directly in conflict with what they have written as historical fact. And what they've written is historical fiction. So mm. we're having to say, here are the facts. And in many cases, I put the exact quote of what was said so that you can read not only here's the fact and here's where you can go get it, here is the actual piece of information that I'm referencing. Wow, John, that is that is just incredible. All right, John, so we're getting ready to uh, kind of um, move, shift gears a little bit, and we're going to talk about a guy by the name of Demas Shikarian. Who was Demas Shikarian, and why is he important to all of this? Demas Shikarian is one of the most interesting figures that is on my website. <laughs> <laughs> he, he is the key to understanding all of this. In fact, there, there are two masterminds behind it. Roy Davis was a mastermind. If you study Roy Davis and know what, what he is and what happened, you can, you can clearly see that he had his hand in this thing. Yeah, Demas and Roy Shikarian... I'm sorry. I'm just going to let the, let the folks know Roy Davis is uh, William Branham's pastor or was William Branham's uh, former pastor. He was the pastor. He was also the imperial wizard of the Ku Klux Klan. Yep. 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 <clears throat> so the second is is the Shikarians. And this name means not, nothing to anybody, but you can pull it up on my website and go through the history if you want. I've got the interlinking. Demas Shakirian was Tatos Kardashian's mm -hmm. nephew. <laughs> he was deeply tied to the Kardashian family. He was also the founder of the Full Gospel Businessmen's Fellowship. <clears throat> he was, if you look up their history, it's phenomenal. There's a, there's a series on Netflix called The Family, where this cult has invaded Washington, D.C., and there are these men who are persuading and influencing politics through this cult, and they have the National Prayer Breakfast. You can find Shakarian through, you know, the Kardashian family right. through Shakarian yep. pushing this National Prayer Breakfast, and William Branham's there, and they have influenced so much that Branham says that after or during the time of the Prayer Breakfast event— uh, Richard Nixon came to Branham's home in Jeffersonville because of this thing. This wow. was a big deal. Man. <clears throat> Shakarian, um, he, he was not just a, a organizer that connected people. He also funded people. He was literally creating the element of entertainment in the Christian environment. And Christianity was entertainment during this time. People yes. like John... John Olstein, who is Joel Olstein, I'm sure you're familiar with, his, his father would have, due to the latter rain affiliation, he, you know, he, John Olstein was a latter rain minister, nearly lost his ministry. Shakarian came in and funded his first tent revival to get him lifted up in the, into recognition. Now, <clears throat> we're deem this a great privilege to be here with you tonight. In this time of fellowship, just uh, prior to the convention of the businessman, uh, it's the convention will start this coming Thursday down at the Ramada. It's on East uh, Van Buren Street. And we certainly invite you all down. There will be some wonderful speakers in the convention. And uh, Brother Velma Gardner is one that I know of. And then I think they have some of the businessmen that's going to speak. And uh, I, I believe Jim Brown was one of them. Yeah. And um, Dr. Reed. Dr. Reed. And, of course, Brother Old Rose is always Old there. Steen from <laughs> Texas. Old Steen from Texas. Brother Oldstein from Texas. Oldstein from Texas. Brother Oldstein from Texas. Okay, so John Osteen, Joel Osteen's father, was part of this whole uh, Branham uh, message ministry or latter rain message that uh, that Jones was involved with. Absolutely, and and you know what, 
the Bible says it accurately by their fruits, you know. Yeah. Look at Joe Osteen. <clears throat> You can find, I'm sure you can find it if you look. There are actually statements that he makes that he sprinkles throughout his sermons where he's actually giving honor to the, the Latter Rain movement. Yep. I found a quote recently published where he's saying that the Latter Rain has produced these wonderful gifts in, of the Spirit in, this, mm -hmm. in the revivals. Yep, I uh, I saw something like that as well, and I and I uh, I'm gonna link I'm gonna put a link to the uh, article that you mentioned about John and, and his uh, John and um and William Branham, and uh, Demas Shakirian. So Demas Shakirian, let me just uh, so Demas Shakirian, who is a nephew of uh, Tatos Kardashian. I'm saying that right. Uh, Tatos Kardashian, uh, the Kardashians, by the way, <laughs> I just want folks Kim, to know Kim the Kardashian's <laughs> great grandfather. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So Demos, uh, Shakarian, who is a nephew of Tatos Kardashian, the founder of the, um, the, um, uh, and it's the, uh, businessmen's fellowship international full, full gospel businessmen full gospel yes yeah. exactly founder of this he act did he ever host um any any did he ever mention jim jones did he ever uh, have jim jones there at one of his businessmen fellowship meetings uh, there were there were chapters of the full gospel businessmen being established in indianapolis during the Cato events and mm. i say plural events Okay. Um, you f you'll find advertisements for it in Voice of Healing and I think even in the newspapers. Shakarian, <clears throat> see, the, the Kardashian family was deep into this type of Pentecostalism. Tatos Kardashian came from Armenia. There was a group of Armenian Christians in L.A. and Palm Springs. And before William Branham became the fame that he was today, there was this quick rise of a cult leader named... Um, Avok Hagopian. He was an Iranian shaman, basically, who came to the United States, and the Kardashians and the Shakarians funded him, and he just swept through the United States in popularity. He ended up creating his own cult. I actually have cult, uh, former cult members from his group who contact me, where they he became the spiritual husband of all the wives, and he had all of these wow. women that he's sleeping with. It's it's unbelievable, weird stuff. But mm. this thing was all all created because of Shakarian. John, there's so much here. It goes so deep. It's like you know, you you have your work cut out for you. You really do. You've got so much happening right now. So. The, the research that you are doing is so super important, and we're just going to pray that uh, God just continues to give you the, the protection, number one, and the uh, ability to continue to dig. And you know what? What's really interesting is that I'll put this video up. This video will go up. But who knows what you'll find in a week or two weeks, you know, <laughs> of how, uh, just how deep this thing actually is. I, I remember saying seven years ago, we had come across so much information. I thought, you know, I, I'm not going to find anything that even compares to this. And I can't remember what it was at the time, but it seems like every single day something new happens. My wow. day starts at about 5 a.m. and I go until I literally drop. <laughs> wow. Wow. All right, John. Well, let me ask you this. Can you talk about any of the other projects that you're working on right now outside of uh, William Branham Research? I, I mentioned this to somebody recently. This thing that we're investigating is very much similar to the Marvel Cinematic Universe. You've got all of these wonderful backstories that create this main overall overarching theme. Yep. And there are so many men that I could – every person that I come across is just as interesting. Wow. But the most interesting of all of these people that I have found so far is John Alexander Dowie. Mm. I'm uh, I'm at page 250, I, I believe, in my book on Dowie, and there are things in there that you just you can't really you can't make up a story like this. Before the Chicago mob controlled Chicago, the Dowie mob controlled the politics, <laughs> the police force. I mean, they they were in control of Chicago, and they literally outgrew Chicago and moved, as you noted, to Zion City. Mm -hmm. 
Well, this this was a massive thing, not just in Illinois, not just in Zion City or Chicago. This was a worldwide movement that he created. Yeah, he actually, if, if I remember correctly, just from doing my research, he actually uh, had people that were in his cult f- in other parts of the world come to Zion City and live. It, it was such a big thing. And, and, and not just the, the part that I'm in now is the most interesting part. He has outgrown Chicago, and I don't want to give too many spoilers for the book, but this this one is worth interesting, worth mentioning because it's interesting. <clears throat> He's outgrown Chicago. Chicago people, citizens, don't know what to do. The police can't stop him. They have tried. There were, I can't remember how many thousand criminal suits against Dowie. Thousands. Yeah. Literally every day he was getting five to ten criminal accusations. They couldn't stop him. He outgrew Chicago. He was untouchable by the law. And people were dying and people were being tortured in his in his healing uh, healing homes. This one woman in particular, she was mentally insane. And their notion of how to quote unquote, heal her was to physically torture her. She was, yeah. they were twisting the limb. She was bruised. Yeah. That, that's this, a, go ahead. This, this created an angry mob and, and where I was headed with the story, two evangelists were setting up Dowie institutes in other, other states, other cities. And they went to Mansfield, Ohio, and they started this group home fellowship, 30 people, the people in Mansfield, 5,000 of them, rose up, dragged them out of the home, stripped them naked, painted them blue, and were going, like literally with color, blue, and were going to tar and feather them, and the police intervened, and it rose to the level that the, the Ohio State government had to get militant to stop and separate this Dowie thing from the, the public. And every single... Um Every single author that supports Dowie that I've read, guys like Learden, Roberts Learden and others, they will say that was all a form of persecution. You know, uh, you know, the thing that just the horrible things that Dowie did and what came out of his movement, including Charles Fox Parham and the Paramites and all of that stuff. Just awful. Hey, John, thank you so much for joining me. I, I, I'd really want to get together again and maybe after how long before that Dowie book is actually finished and ready to uh, go up for sale. You know, I, I have so many things in motion right now. The research for Jones is just as important as the Dowie movement. <clears throat> I'm literally lim- limited by the number of times that my fingers can move in a day <laughs> because I'm, I'm, I'm typing. I, I type in until my hand physically locks up. I can't wow. type anymore. Wow. I'm going that fast. So I had hoped to have it out by the end of this year. Um, I don't know if I'm going to make that timeline or not. Well, you know what? When it comes out, I will be the first one to promote it. And I want you to be the first one to talk about, you know, the first interview. I want it right here. Right, right here, buddy. Right Right here. (laughs) Sounds good. John, thank you so much for joining me today. And it's been just an incredible, uh, just an incredible talk. And to think, just to think that. Who knows, just a couple of weeks from now, there may be more. So, folks, there may be more to come on this. This, this, there, I'm sure. There will be. <laughs> <laughs> this tree has so many branches. <laughs> with, with the nature of this, I would say this sewer has so many tunnels. <laughs> <laughs> That's a really good analogy. Thanks for joining us, and uh, Lord willing, we'll see you next time.